Hi. Welcome to Drinking the Kool-Aid. Uh, welcome. <laughs> I'm Megan. I'm Hannah. And guess what? That was way too much enthusiasm. Yeah. Holy crap, what? I already have to... Correct something? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love the... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Dude, it's so I, good. I love that you make it like two parts into a story and then you're like, now nah, I have to correct something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I was editing part two. Did you say something like that I totally missed? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this phrase came out of my face. <laughs> I said... <laughs> He was a menage to society. And then I'm listening back and I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck? Obviously, he was a menace. <laughs> Why would he be a menage? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I've, I don't know. Oh, God. But, I mean, in my head, mm-hmm. I probably heard, like, the first few letters and just assumed that you know, like I just assumed menace. Maybe you thought that was a real that, thing. You're like, yeah, he was a menage. Of the Nikki kind? <laughs> um. <laughs> oh, no. Something like that. No, yeah. I probably just or a like. Menage a trois. Yeah, I guess I don't know what happened. Yeah. Either way, I was laughing when I was editing, and I thought, wow, I hope everyone else just laughs along when I do that kind of shit. Or maybe they're just going to be me and don't even notice it. Uh, that's great, too. Yeah. Um, that's it. Okay. <laughs> I just was like, yeah, let's talk about that real quick. Got it. <laughs> it probably, people wouldn't notice it if I didn't bring it up, but I just think it's so funny. I mean, like I said, I didn't, so... So, I gotta call myself out. I mean, everybody's <laughs> got to at some point. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, hey, let's start part three of Stephen Stainer's story today. Let's do it. Okay. So, the book I used was I Know My First Name is Stephen by Mike Eccles, and I watched Captive Audience, A Real American Horror Story, Episodes 1 and 2 on Hulu. Recap. Ken Parnell and his friend Murph kidnapped Stephen Stainer. Ken was easily able to move Stephen from school to school, completely undetected, and he was not forced to provide a birth certificate or early school records for him. He dated a woman named Barbara, and the two of them were sexually assaulting Stephen. Then Ken tried to sexually assault one of her children as well. The relationship between Barbara and Ken was coming to an end because she found somebody else named John Allen that she was falling for. At the end of part two, Stephen had finally confessed to a friend that he was being sexually molested, but he said he could not turn Ken in because that's his dad. Ken had been taking care of Stephen for several years at this point, and he manipulated him into believing that the court awarded him custody because his parents didn't want him anymore. So we are starting in the spring of 1978. And things were fizzling out with John Allen and Barbara. So she loaded up her kids and went back to Ken. So what she didn't know was that she was hand-delivering her children to a predator. Ken again targeted young Kenny, and he put his hand down his pants, and Kenny was able to get away. But unfortunately, during this whole situation, uh, Ken grabbed his younger brother, Lloyd, and locked the bedroom door and did sexually assault him. Okay. Yeah. So when Barbara returned home... Kenny told her what happened, and she called the sheriff, and the sheriff didn't believe her. Why would they, right? Right, exactly. Why would you believe that when children are saying that something happened? I mean, come on here. She did move out 
and didn't have any further contact with Ken after that point. This did not stop Ken from pursuing other children. Stephen tried to make sure that none of his friends were left alone with Ken, but Ken was still using the same sneaky tactics that he'd been using all along. Okay, as if, like, this poor kid has, like, not enough issues and problems and things he has to worry about, and now he has to worry about keeping his friends from being alone with him. Right, Ugh. trying to protect other children. It's disgusting. And it's like, that's not his job. So He's sad. He's a child. So, so sad. Yeah. Just as he had done before, he called up Stephen's friend Jeff Norton and arranged to pick him up from school for a sleepover. But Stephen didn't know about this, so he was on the school bus riding that home. Ken offered to give the 12-year-old some money for the upcoming fair if he let him sexually assault him. But Jeff refused. Once Stephen got home, Ken threw the boys a party and got them drunk. After he did this, he took nude photos of both of the boys. Here's just another instance where the ball got dropped, and this whole story could have gotten blown up if somebody would have followed up on this. So, when Stephen was in the seventh grade, his teacher, Gerald Butler, had them reading, like, an extensive article in Junior Scholastic that was about missing children. The class read it together, and they had a discussion. After the bell rang and the kids went outside for recess, Stephen's friend Damon stayed behind and told the teacher that Stephen claims he was taken away when he was really young because his parents didn't want him anymore. Stephen was standing back a little ways, and he seemed really frightened. And the teacher asked, like, do you ever get to see your parents? And he said no. After this conversation, he went to the teacher's lounge, and another staff member said that they had heard the same thing about Stephen. Two teachers had heard a strange story about their student, and nobody followed up on this. It was just left. Like, that was it? That was it. Now... Holy crap. Okay, I can... It's a hard one because kids say a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And I know dang well that I knew kids when I was younger that said shit like that. But when you are hearing it, when two different teachers are hearing it, and it's not just, like, chatter on the playground that you overheard, like, a kid saying something to, you know, like, another kid is actually coming up to you and telling you, like, here's what this child is saying, and then a second teacher hears that, that absolutely, like, that's us. At that point, somebody should be like, that's weird. Well, and this I is not normal. think, like, as a teacher, you legally need to follow up on that stuff. Well, definitely now, I guess I don't know then, but yes. True. Yeah, I don't know about the time, you know, that this was being said. I do want to say, though, So, the teachers claim that this happened, but both Damon and Stephen later said this never happened, but Gerald's peers say that he's a very honest man, and at least one other teacher confirmed that they heard the story in the teacher's lounge, and I kind of feel like there's nothing he can gain from this story because it kind of makes the teacher look like shit. Right. So I don't know why he would make it up, but maybe he did. So either way, if it was something that really, truly happened, it is a bummer that this wasn't followed up on and nobody thought, let's just check into this story Yep. and see if it's anything, you know? Stephen did have another friend named George that was also being sexually assaulted by Ken. He picked George up from school and, as usual, sent Stephen home on the bus so that they could have time alone together. George asked Ken if he would stop and buy him some cigarettes, and he said yes if they could have a little fun later on. George didn't know what that meant, but assumed that they would be, like, playing games or something. Unfortunately, yeah. Like a child would think. Exactly. So he agreed. When Stephen got home... Ken got the two of the kids drunk and had them take their clothes off. 
George insists that he went into the room with Ken and he was holding an open jar of Vaseline, but he says nothing happened and he went home and told his mother. However, he told his mom that he was raped. So I don't know if it's like an embarrassment thing here. I mean, I could definitely see that. Yes. Or just not wanting it to be... Known publicly? Yeah. Absolutely. Like, if it's known, then it's real. You know what I mean? Mm hmm And his, so his mom, Joan Mitchell, made a police report and said that she was positive her son had been raped. She fully believed the story. It became common knowledge around town that Ken had sodomized George, but nobody did anything about this and nothing came of the police report. Fucking wonderful. Right. So first, the sheriff is saying, I don't believe that this guy is doing anything to kids. Now another kid comes forward and says, yeah, it sure happened. And here's a police report and you're still not going to do anything about it. You know what this feels like? What? This feels a lot like that town bully story. <laughs> Just because like yeah. the police are li like people are literally telling them and they're like, meh. Right. Nothing we can do. Yeah. They just let it breeze on by. Nothing. No big deal. Wasn't he also Ken? Ken McElroy. Shut up. I didn't even put that together. Oh, my goodness. That is weird. But yeah. yeah. He sure was. Okay. So. Do it if your name is Ken. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're not really on board with that right now. <laughs> Compchi was a small town, but apparently it was full of literal monsters. In Stevens School, there were several cases of children that were being sexually abused by their parents. Everyone lived by a code where they minded their own business. What the actual fuck? And that's what scares me a lot about some of these really small towns. Like, don't get me wrong, this doesn't happen in every small town. But I have heard this several times. Yeah. It's just a thing where they go by their very own codes. The town you know? bully one. They yeah. did that too. They did. And that to me is really scary. In 1978, when Stephen was 13, he went to a party with an older group of kids and they were drinking and smoking pot. This what? is awful. We only made it to 13. Yeah, 13 years old, oh. and all of this has happened. Yeah. One of the teenagers recalls that he started crying and saying that he just wanted to go home, but nobody knew what he was talking about, and he never elaborated. As he got older, Ken became less interested in Stephen because he liked younger children. He started using Stephen to lure other boys in. He would pick one out and have Stephen call them and invite them over. In July of 1979, I, hate, uh, I know, it's it's just so gross. And, and it's just so awful for him, too, because like I said earlier, like, he's already gone through so much and dealing with so much. He's trying to protect his friends, and then he puts, Ken puts him in the position to literally have to be the person to lure them in. Right, and he doesn't want any part of this. Oh he has made God. that clear time and time again, you know. So in July of 1979, the Ukiah Daily Journal ran a story about the discovery of the bodies of a young teenage boy and girl in shallow graves in the forest, which was about 10 miles from Kompchi. Ken immediately decided that they needed to move, and I mean... That's most likely because the police are going to be milling around, so he can't just be a, a sitting duck, you right. know? They headed to a cabin that was about 50 miles away. There were no neighbors. They were going to be the only people living on the ranch with 4,400 acres of hilltop pasture, woodlands, and valleys. This was truly devastating for Stephen. He finally had friends at his old home, and now he was in complete isolation with Ken again. There were hardly any vehicles that even passed the house. Ken did find a job as a desk clerk for the Palace Hotel. It required a long commute, an hour each way, and the roads were all twisting, and only four of the 40 miles were on straight pavement. Okay, so this must be the house. Oh my god, you already picked in. up on it. Because you said yeah. the long 
roads and I know that and you said there wasn't like many cars passing and I think you said the road in the very beginning mm-hmm. didn't have many cars going by and it was a very long one right wow you were listening to me I was <laughs> <laughs> imagine that wow I'm like actually really surprised <laughs> I was curious I was actually when we started the uh mm-hmm. this part of it I was like I wonder when that's gonna come back around yeah and there it is so this is the house then that they were at yes when he the other one okay that is correct taken. got it yes Stephen was not happy about the idea of attending a new school. I mean, he's already done this a million times at this point. He had been at Mendocino City Schools for three years, so he convinced Ken to allow him to continue going there for the ninth grade. Ken would rush home early each morning to take him part way to school. He would drop him off in Mendocino County or Mendocino City and Stephen would hitchhike the rest of the way. Stephen was able to try out for the football team, and he got starting position. Once football season ended, Ken refused to drive him partway to school any longer. Stephen was forced to transfer to Point Arena High School in mid-November. Since the Point Arena school bus ended its route at the power lines, which was nine miles down the road, Stephen was absent from school more than 20 days. He did not make the basketball team because he was unreliable when it came to transportation. And it wasn't even his fault. No. I mean, what do you do when the bus, you know, stops nine miles away from you? That's pretty far. That is, no, that's really far. I mean, for especially for a kid. Yeah. According to former Mendocino County DA Joe Allen and his chief deputy DA George McClure, there was a big reason why Ken moved to that ranch. Ken had been hired by Duke Stornetta to guard the brothers' hidden commercial plots of marijuana, which they grew in secluded areas of the Mountain View Ranch. During the 1970s and 1980s, Some members of the Stornetta family were known to be cultivating cannabis, and um, the resident deputy sheriff had an income many times greater than could be accounted for by his salary. Although his usual public explanation was that he had been a very shrewd real estate investor. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. (laughs) You betcha, buddy. (laughs) The officers said that in Mendocino County, in those days, old-timers and newcomers who grew pot were arrested, except for the old-timers who grew it in the area under the jurisdiction of that particular deputy. Ah! So, (laughs) yeah. Mm. It's really hard to piece this one together here, folks. I know. Oh, man, that's great. The Stornetta brothers, their cousin Henry Stogie Stornetta, tried to hire someone to kill his wife. Stogie's plot was discovered, and this led to an investigation where the same deputy sheriff opened his safe under a court order, and he reported that there were no drugs or anything unusual. But he did find fifty to two hundred fifty thousand dollars in fifties and hundreds. Stogie was tried and convicted and served time in prison. So, Ken was hired to watch the watch the land, but he had his own ideas about this. He started selling the marijuana that he was guarding, and he used kids to do it. Okay, that was funny for, like, a second, and then you ruined it. Yes, absolutely. Once the kid got involved. I'm sorry. He was selling the pot that he was protecting? Yes, that is correct. Right. Oh, no! The first first part of that sentence is funny, and then it's like, Yeah, then you just, yeah, you just, like, threw a wrench right in it, brought it right back down, but, you know. Thanks for giving me that moment of laughter. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) He was uh, paying kids to sell it for him, and he was also offering more money if they brought back a younger kid to be his son. 
Oh, God. So he's oh, telling God. these children oh, to go get a son for him no. and bring him back. No, 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 no. Oh, God, I hate this so much. Oh, yeah. It's not good. Every single time yes. you say, like, he wanted them to go pick a son or that he needed to pick another one or they need to bring one. I just, it's so gross that it just makes my whole body, like, my skin crawl. Yeah. <sighs> when the new year began, Ken officially ended the sex acts with Steven and began increasing his efforts to kidnap a younger child and potentially get rid of Stephen forever. I mean, I saw that coming. Yeah. By early 1980, Ken still did not have a younger son like he wanted, and he was starting to get desperate. He found a five-year-old boy named Timmy White, and he started following him around and making plans to kidnap him. Ken took both Stephen and another boy named Sean to Ukiah several times so that they could sit and just watch this young boy. He started grooming Sean to be his partner in crime. He told him how useless Stephen had become to him, and he would give him marijuana when they hung out. He took Sean to a hotel one night, and on Valentine's Day morning, they went to a McDonald's and... Ken told the teen exactly what he was going to do in the kidnapping. They headed out about 8.30 a.m. to search for Timmy White, but they couldn't find him. So they went to some garage sales and Salvation Army while they waited. They also went to the thrifty drugstore so that Ken could buy a bottle of Nitol sleeping pills, just like he had done with Stephen when he first got him. When it was a little past 11, they drove back to Yokayo Elementary. The kindergartners were released at 11.30, and that's when they spotted Timmy walking with another classmate. Timmy is the one they snatch, right? Yeah, he okay. sure is. I thought I recognized that name. Yep, yep. Ken stopped the car, and Sean got out. And so he was supposed to pretend that he was just, like, checking the right rear tire, his job was to ask Timmy for help, grab him, get him in the back seat, and close the door quickly so that they could speed off. So Sean turns to Timmy and asks him if he can hold the tire's valve stem to keep it from leaking air. Timmy was smart, and he said no, and he walked away. Good job, Timmy. Yeah, because adults and older children do not need help from younger kids. No, they do not. Well, this scared Sean. So he decided not to go after Timmy, and things weren't going as planned. So he just hopped back in the car, and then Ken lost it. He started screaming at him. He was like, go get Timmy. Get him now. So he jumped out and started running after Timmy, but then Timmy starts running because this older kid is running after him. Sean caught up to him wrapped his arms around the young boy and tossed him into the car, kicking and screaming. Ken immediately told Timmy that his mother was sick, but at the same time, Sean told him they were going to the dentist. So Timmy is, like, confused and afraid. Okay, like, are there, like, no teachers outside? Apparently not. Everyone just, like, releases the kids and then just goes yeah. about their business? Yeah. Okay. And, you know, because he's kicking and screaming, and how That's does what I'm nobody saying. see this? Well, not only that, but, like, how do you not see a older kid chasing down a small child that probably does not look very happy? Right, and it's in the middle of the day. I mean, there's a difference. There's a difference between like seeing a kid that's pissed off because you said no in a store and you're pulling them out crying over your shoulder. And a kid that has legitimate fear in their face because they're being chased by somebody they don't fucking know. Yeah. I agree. I don't know how that actually happened. Yeah. Sean gave Timmy the sleeping pill and some fruit punch, and then both of the boys laid down in the back so that they could not be seen in the windows. Sean was paid for his services with two bottles of Jack Daniels, and he then flagged down a friend for a ride so that he could get out of there. And he never mentioned what happened. Which I also am like, 
what? I'd be so scared, I'd be spilling my guts immediately. But this kid didn't. I d- yeah. <laughs> I guess the two bottles of Jack was... It was enough. Enough to keep him quiet. Yeah. Later that afternoon, Ken picked up Stephen from the bus stop, and that's when he saw Timmy in the back of the car, and they all silently drove back to the cabin. Around this time, Timmy's mother, Angela, had filed a report when her son didn't show up at the babysitter's house and the police were out looking for him. Timmy lived with his mother, Angela, and her second husband, Jim White, and Timmy had an older sister, Nicole. Jim had adopted both children when they got married the previous year, and they lived seven miles south of Ukiah on Blue Oak Drive. Angela had just started working at the Mendocino County Board of Realtors, and Timmy started kindergarten at Yokio, and his sister was in the first grade at the school just across the street. The family decided to go with a small private daycare center for their children that was run by Diane Crawford in her home just a few blocks from the kids' schools. Angela dropped her son off at school on Valentine's morning, and at 11.50 a.m., Diane Crawford called her at work. Angela was on a long-distance call, so she asked another coworker to just tell her she'd call her back shortly. A few minutes later, she was still on the call, so she wrote a note to her coworker and asked him to call Diane. After he hung up, he said, Timmy's not home. I'll go look for him. Angela wasn't that concerned initially. It was Valentine's Day, and so she thought that maybe Timmy stayed late at school because they were having this big class party. Well, and I think you're trying to, like, not panic right away, too, because kids will be kids, and you gotta be like, well... You know, there's a possibility this kid or my kid went here or here or did this or, you know, slower today. You know, you're just trying to keep yourself sane. Yeah, it's just hanging out with a friend, you know, anything. You don't want to jump to the worst conclusion here. Timmy got out of school at 1130 and suddenly she looked over and realized, oh, my God, it's noon. That doesn't make sense. Something was wrong. She locked up the office and headed out to look for her son. She stopped at the school, and the principal said that the class got out on time. They didn't go late for the party. After hearing this, Angela contacted the police. The weather was bad, and it was raining, just like the day that Stephen had been kidnapped on years earlier. Two days after Timmy's disappearance, tracking dogs were brought in from Sacramento to scour the 10-square-block neighborhood between Yokio Elementary and the babysitter's home, but they were not able to pick up a scent because it had rained for three days prior oh, to that. Oh, shit. Which I've actually heard that sometimes the rain can help and can increase the scent for them, but in certain scenarios, like with the wind mixture, too... It washes it away. So it's really hit or miss well, with damn, that. okay. I didn't know that. I didn't either. I recently heard that on another podcast, and I was like, whoa. Interesting. All right, then. Smith Air Service provided a helicopter for Ukiah policemen searching the remote hills west of town, but the rain ended up washing the grease from the rotor's bearings, and so the flights got cut short. That can happen? I guess. And what? Maybe not anymore. I would have never thought of that. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it was just in in that time. I'm not sure. But hopefully that's not something that just happens now. That would be a bummer. Not be a good thing. (laughs) Yeah. On the first night of Timmy's kidnapping, Ken forced him to sleep in the same bed with him. And Timmy recalls feeling very strange about this. Prior to the kidnapping, He had tried to hire a babysitter in Ukiah, but everybody turned him down because of the distance to the cabin. This meant that he had no choice but to leave Timmy alone in the cabin for a while every day. Stephen would go to school, and Ken worked the graveyard shift at the Palace Hotel. Stephen didn't like it, but he was instructed to give Timmy a night hall sleeping tablet before he left for school each day. 
But Timmy says that he rarely slept after Stephen went to school. He just sat there alone. So I don't think he actually gave it to him very many times, if at all. He did see a phone and considered calling for help, but he was too scared of what Ken would do to him. Now, Timmy didn't know this, but Ken actually kept a dial lock on the phone, so he couldn't have used it anyways. Many people saw Timmy with Ken, and they would play outside the home. Ken dyed Timmy's hair from platinum blonde to dark brown, and he felt so confident about this new disguise that he announced he was taking the boys out to eat at Pirate's Cove. A friend of Stevens remembers this incident. Marcia Beale says, quote, My cousins own the Pirate's Cove, and one of them, Darla Reynolds, said that when they came in, she looked at the little boy and she thought, Wow, he really resembles that little boy in the newspaper. But you know how you think of something and then you take a second look and go, Oh, but I don't want to get involved. And this is children, so I'm not even blaming them here. Yeah, and honestly, I totally get it because how many, I mean, how many weird things have mm-hmm. we probably ignored in our lifetime? Yeah. Without, I mean, like in this instance, like if you're an adult, I don't care if you, you just You see think, something, you say something. Yeah, if you even just think for like a split yeah. second, just call, just do something like... If it's even, I mean, and what if, what if there that split second changes everything? Yeah, I'd rather get like four wrong tips, and someone at least try yeah. versus getting nothing that could have been something. Yep. But yeah, they're children, so yeah, not no, even the amount of things that I've literally probably heard and been like, nah, nah, that mm-hmm. was that was weird, but meh. Absolutely, yeah. A few days after the Pirates Cove dinner, Kim Peace saw Stephen and Timmy sitting in Ken's car in the parking lot at the Manchester General Store. That evening, she saw Timmy's picture in the newspaper and she kept thinking, where have I seen that little kid before? She finally realized she had seen him sitting in a car, but of course she didn't know Ken. And I'm not sure if she even contacted the police about this. I'm Kind of guessing not, but, you know, who knows? I mean, it wasn't mentioned in the book that she called, but maybe. Stephen does say that he initially felt jealousy towards Timmy when he first arrived. He didn't want to continue being abused by Ken, but at the same time, this was his father for the last several years, and he didn't want to be replaced. And it was probably, like, the only type of attention he was getting. That's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, like, a mixture of different feelings It's not attention he wanted, but it was the only attention. Right. And, you know, sometimes, even if it's bad attention, it's attention, you know? He did start to feel very protective over Timmy and worried that Ken was going to sexually assault him. So he started returning from Point Arena High School at noon each day instead of finishing his entire day of school. He also began carrying his Bowie knife inside his boot just in case he saw Ken harming Timmy. It only took a few short days for the two boys to become very close. Stephen confided in Timmy and told him that he had also been kidnapped. Timmy asked him to take him home, and Stephen agreed to this, but he said he had to put a plan in place first. On February 28th, Stephen called up a friend named Damon and invited him over for the weekend, but he declined because he knew Timmy White was there, and he didn't want to get in trouble. So it's just interesting that, like, another kid knows about this, and nobody is telling their parents. Ken had used a teenager named Sean to help with the kidnapping. Well, now this kid was talking, and other kids knew that Timmy was there. But somehow, that information didn't make its way to the police. Or if it did, they didn't do anything about it. Damon thought about things, and he called Stephen back to tell him, Listen, there's a $15,000 reward for Timmy's safe return. And he told him, you should take him to the police and claim that money. Stephen wasn't after the money. 
but he was planning to get Timmy home safe. Here's what he didn't know, though. Uh Uh-oh. Ken was planning to kill Stephen, and he was going to get help from another teenager who was an acquaintance of Stephen's. Okay, well, that's fucked up that it is an acquaintance, but I, I, you know, knew... That he would want to get rid of him. Yeah, this is unfortunately where this was going. Right. He doesn't have a use for him now because he likes younger children, which I really hate saying that over and over. This teenager was going to bury his body in a grave that he and his accomplice had already dug along the upper uninhabited reaches of the Garcia River. Once the job was done, Ken and Timmy were going to move to Arkansas. This plan was supposed to happen right after Timmy was kidnapped, but the winter rains made it impossible to access this particular area. The and one good to, the one good thing about winter. Yeah. <sighs> and so the plan got delayed, which is amazing. The single good thing you can find in winter. We found it. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> Even though Timmy was at the cabin now, Ken still felt relaxed enough to stop for a beer at the Samoa Club every morning after work. He would sit there and talk about Timmy White's disappearance, and he would offer up theories on what could have happened. Once he got home, he would sleep from late afternoon until 9 at night. He had been working the graveyard shift at the Palace Hotel in Ukiah for seven months, and he was going to start his new position as the hotel's security guard, meaning he would need to leave earlier than usual to make sure he was there on time. Why? Okay. But, like, why do so many sleazy people become security guards? I believe that it's because it gives a little sense of power. Oh. You know what? That checks. You know, and and people that are predators or sleazy you know they like to have power over people no that that makes sense actually so that's what i think as he left for work steven made breakfast for him and timmy they bundled up steven grabbed a knife to hide in his boot and they headed out steven was filled with fear what would happen if ken caught them trying to escape what if he suddenly returned home it didn't matter He had made up his mind. He was getting Timmy back to his family. They had attempted to hitchhike before, but Timmy always whined and complained about being cold, wet, and hungry. This is the first time he saw headlights on the pavement coming towards them. He got the courage to stick his thumb up, and the car stopped. Stephen climbed into the front seat and pulled Timmy on his lap. The man that picked them up spoke Spanish and knew very little English, but He was able to tell them that a friend was having car trouble and he was on his way to Ukiah, which is exactly where the boys needed to go. Stephen told the driver that they were on their way home. Their new home was in Ukiah. The man did stop to help a friend with their vehicle and they continued on their journey. They're going home. (laughs) Yes. I love that. I do too. And yes, this is the part that we started with in part one. So, if you're like, I think I've heard this. (laughs) Stephen later said, quote, We got over the last hill, going into Ukiah, and it really scared me because I was trying to think about what I would do when we got there. I thought, it's me against the world. I'm alone now. There's no one to turn to and no one to help me make the decisions. Well, and he doesn't know who his parents are. Right. I mean, that's awful. Mm Mm-hmm. He said, The main objective and most important thing was to get Timmy home safe and sound. I just didn't think about doing anything else then. I knew that I'd be on the run then, but I didn't want to think about it. The only person I had to talk to was Timmy, and I didn't want to do that in front of this guy. I didn't know for sure how much English he could understand or nothing. But then we started up South State Street into Ukiah, and Timmy turns his head and whispers to me, that were near his babysitters, and that's where he wanted to go. So I told the guy to let us out by the bottle shop. Then Timmy and me walked over to where he said the babysitter lived, but nobody was home. Since the babysitter wasn't home, the boys headed south, trying to get to Timmy's house, but they got lost and turned north 
to get to the phone booth where they looked up the address for the Ukiah police station. They passed the babysitter's house a second time, but she still wasn't there. So they continued to the police station. They passed along the southeast corner of the Palace Hotel where Ken was working. Which I gotta say, like, holy hell, I bet they were just so scared passing well, yeah, that because place. They literally escape and then they have to go right fucking past where he literally is. Yeah. And what if he sees them out a window or what if he happens to be standing outside at that very moment? They got to the police station and Stephen told Timmy to go inside and tell them his name so that they could get him home safely. Veteran patrol officer Bob Warner was standing inside near the door shortly after 11 and he said, quote, I was getting ready to leave the station when I noticed a small boy come to the front door, push the door open, and then look back out toward the street and turn around and run back out. He just started to come inside the door, and then he turned and went back out. Of course, being that time of night and seeing a small boy doing such things, I got a little curious as to what was going on. So I went out the front, and I saw this young boy running across the parking lot. I noticed another older boy walking westbound on Stanley, just approaching Main Street. I was afraid that if I just took off running, that the older boy would run and we might not get either one. So I called for another unit using my portable radio. Fortunately, there was another unit coming down Main. It was Russell Van Voorhees, and he stopped them right in front of the Salvation Army store. As soon as he said he had them, I got into my patrol car and went up to the location. When I got there, Van Voorhees was holding the little boy in his arms, and he says to me, Would you believe it? This is Timmy White. And I found it hard to believe, because Timmy had his hair dyed dark brown. So Van Voorhees was basically talking to Timmy. And I started talking to this older boy. I asked him if he was with Timmy, and he says he was. I asked him his name, and he told me it was Steven Stainer. And then Van Voorhees says, he says he's been missing from Merced for seven years. You just gave me chills everywhere. (laughs) So many chills. (laughs) They're multiplying. (laughs) The officers brought the boys to the station, and Timmy White's mother, Angela, was called, and she's like, I am on my way. She went running into the station, took one look at Timmy, who had dark brown hair, not platinum blonde, and she said, that's not him. (gasps) And she fainted. Shut up! Yeah. No, you're not staying with me! (laughs) (laughs) I'm not. (laughs) The poor thing fainted (laughs) and thought it wasn't him. Which I'm, I'm sure you're so worked up. It's just like trying oh. to laugh at it, but absolutely. I mean, it's like you've got so many it's emotions such a build up, you know, and it's like, uh, and then you see that it's like the wrong color hair, and yeah. of course, you're just like immediately like, mm-hmm. your body just goes. Get, yeah, I thought for sure you were gonna be like, she saw. Him. Oh, what do you think? I thought you no, I just thought you were going to be like, oh, she saw like the brown hair and immediately was like, that's my kid. Like knew oh. immediately. And I was going to be like, oh, a mom knows her oh, son. No. And then you're like, she's a poor thing. <laughs> oh, I am such an asshole. Oh, my God. It's not laughing at her. It's just such a crazy it, situation. It really is. And it, no, I, I mean, like, yeah, I'm sure that with all those emotions, like. It's kind of like being love blind, you know? Yeah. Like, you just don't... You ha- you were beelining for him, had his picture in your mind, and then it looks different. Right, I exactly. Yeah. And, you know, she might not have even gotten up close to him no. if she fainted right away. You know, her body just gave out. Once the officers got Angela up, she took another look, and she was like, oh, that is Timmy. Meanwhile... Stephen was brought into an interrogation room, but he had very conflicting emotions going on. The officers wanted him to give a description of Ken and tell them where he was, but he felt like he was betraying him. He later recalled that, quote, I just felt gratitude towards him for taking care of me. You know, he took care of me for seven years, so what am I going to do? 
return the favor by turning him in? Chief Johnson explained that, quote, he wasn't going to tell us who his dad was until we promised that if the man was sick, we would see that he got some help. Then finally, he told us what his dad's name was and where he was working, but that took a lot of talking on our part. Ken was working his first shift as a security guard that night, so officers were sent over to get him. It was his first shift. First shift. (laughs) When they entered the lobby, they went to the front desk, and they asked the desk clerk if Kenneth Parnell worked there. And at that very moment, he walked around the corner, and the desk clerk was like, here he is now. Yes. (laughs) Finally, some good thing. Yes. Good things are finally happening, guys. <laughs> Uh-oh, Hannah's flapping her arms. I, I didn't realize I was doing that, honestly. <laughs> She's taking I was, off. wasn't I? <laughs> I was going places. <laughs> Once they brought him to the station, Stephen says that one of the officers bullied him into identifying Ken. They brought him into a room and made him look through a window to confirm that it was him. Timmy had his whole family with him during this ordeal, but Stephen's family hadn't even been contacted. He was alone and he was scared. What if he got in trouble for Timmy's kidnapping? What if Ken told them that he was involved? When he was first kidnapped, his father, Dell, had suffered a slipped disc. But remember, Stephen thought it was a heart attack. So he didn't know if his father was even alive anymore. And that's something that had always stuck in his head. The officers had called Merced police and they were heading to the station to pick up Stephen to take him home. And his very first question was, is my dad still alive? Oh, my God. Yeah. Dell was alive. The police sergeant in Merced was Mark Dosetti, and he called the Stainers to tell them that he had news about their son and he would be at their door soon. Unfortunately, they thought something bad like happened they found to his their body. Oh, other, other son. son. <gasps> Shut up! Because no, Carrie was on a camping trip in Yosemite National Park with some friends. No. Yeah, so that's just, like, real unfortunate timing there. That is so awful, dude. Yeah, so now they think something's bad with Carrie, but they were blown away to find out Stephen was alive. Just before 4 a.m., Ukiah Police Detective John Williams asked Stephen to provide a statement in his own words. Quote, My name is Stephen Stainer. I am 14 years of age. I don't know my true birth date, but I use April 18th, 1968. I know my first name is Stephen. I'm pretty sure my last name is Stainer. And if I have a middle name, I don't know it. You're breaking me. I know. This story, it's going to hit you in a lot of feels, man. At 4.30 a.m., Sunday, March 2nd, 1980, the story of Stephen and Timmy's safe return was sent to the Associated Press Office in San Francisco. Initially, Stephen tried to cover for Ken when he provided his statements. He said that he had been spoiled, Ken took care of him, and he never did anything sexual to him. Well, the problem is, is he's the only person he's known for all these years, and he is like a father figure to him. Of course. Of course he wants to protect him. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Weeks later, the truth did finally come out about all the sexual abuse on Stephen, but Ken had never done anything to Timmy. When officers were sent to the cabin, they said that the road leading up to it was crooked and there were mudslides. The weather was extremely bad, and it was very cloudy, rainy, cold, and dark. It was described as a no-man's land. None of the doors were locked on the cabin, and it was freezing cold inside, like a dungeon. There were dirty clothes everywhere, food had been left out, and there were dirty dishes. They had an outdoor toilet, and everything inside the cabin was dirty and had a stench. The officers said that Stephen smelled pretty bad when he arrived at the station. You could tell that he wasn't bathing very often. 
They brought Steven with to the cabin, and he was able to get his dog, Queenie. Yes! I have been <laughs> wondering where the heck the dog was yeah. this whole time. Queenie is there. He got Queenie back. <laughs> He was rushed to a news conference where he clutched his dog and said, quote, I got to like Timmy. I knew what Parnell was doing was wrong. I just gave him a whole life ahead of him, and it's with his parents. Timmy had been missing for 16 days, and he said Stephen became his friend and would read him comic books during their long days in that tiny cabin. Timmy told the police that Ken told him that he knew his mother, Angela, and she said it was okay for Timmy to live with him. Oh, my God. Officers brought Angela into the booking room window so that she could take a look at Ken, and she confirmed she had absolutely no idea who this man was. Oh, my God. And Timmy says, quote, He told me that you knew him, and you didn't. I didn't know big people lie. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's, no! like, the cutest thing. <laughs> that is the saddest and cutest thing I know. I have probably ever it's heard. It's just so pure innocent. Ugh. Yeah, Timmy, unfortunately, they fucking do. Unfortunately. Before leaving the station, Angela went into the room where Stephen was. She kissed his cheek and thanked him for bringing her son home safe. Timmy was later examined by a doctor at the local hospital, and it was confirmed there were no signs of physical or sexual abuse. Stephen had gotten him out of there in time. That's amazing. Yes. When they got home at 3 a.m., Angela asked Timmy what he wanted to do, and he said, eat spaghetti and take a bath. That's legit. Yeah. I love it. I mean, that's what I want to do when I come home when I'm drunk. I just want tacos. Like, that sounds great. Mm hmm He said he wanted to throw away all his clothes that he was wearing because Ken had put them on him, and he didn't want anything to remind him of Ken. They attempted to wash the dye from his hair, but they couldn't, and it took a few months before it turned a reddish color and the blonde started to grow out again. The family was so excited to have Timmy back that they stayed up all night drinking hot chocolate and playing Old Maid. One of the first people to call them was Timmy's babysitter, Diane Crawford. She had been out for dinner with her husband when the boys arrived at her house the night before. At Stephen's home, they learned at 3 a.m. that he was still alive, and he didn't get home until 7 that night, which I gotta tell you, I would lose my damn mind yeah, the, waiting I mean, that long. Absolutely not. Oh. I would probably at that point just like, Start walking. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care the fight. It could be like 500 miles and I'd still start walking. I'll come get you myself. Just to distract myself yeah. until then. The family made banners that said, Welcome home, Steve, as they waited for him to arrive. The police had to counsel Stephen's parents, Dell and Kay, before bringing him there. Colbeth said, quote, In his parents' minds, he was this little child coming home. So I told them, your son is a very grown-up young man, and he's somewhat independent. He's a 14-year-old near adult, and you'll just have to recognize that. It was hard for them to come to terms with that, though. Their child was grown up, and they missed it. Well, yeah, and he's frozen in time, I'm sure, in their mind yes. at the age they lost him. That's exactly right. You know, and you're not thinking about how this is all time that was stolen, you know? He did age. He grew up with somebody else. Yeah. Stephen's younger sister, Jody said, quote, I remembered when my grandpa Tal died when Stephen was gone. I prayed that God would take good care of him, and if Steve was up there, take good care of him, too. Oh, my God. And I remembered those puff balls that are like flowers, that when you blow on them, they go everywhere. Well, we used to blow them and make a wish that Steve would come back home. You know? You'd blow them and then clap your hands and make a wish. We'd always do that. But now Steve was really coming home. Okay, the puff balls. Yeah, the little I puff balls. I love that. They are no longer dandelions. They are They're puff, puff balls. balls. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> I know. Um, but I had never heard of clapping your hands after. 
I never did that. Did you? And nope, but maybe that's why none of my wishes never came true. Oh, damn. Maybe that's where we went wrong. <gasps> we didn't have the right protocol. Yeah. We're going to get us some of those little puff balls this summer. I mean, it might have been that or the fact that I always, like, popped off the, like, dandelion tops and they probably didn't like that much, but, you know. Oh, yeah. And then the yellow ones you always had to rub on your chin to see if you like butter. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't think it, no, it wasn't rubbing on your chin. You used to, like, twirl it under your chin. And then if, like, the reflection was yellow. Oh, I think I just rubbed them on people. Oh, you like butter. <laughs> God. Okay. All right. Well, sorry to all the people my sister rubbed dandelions on. <laughs> I'm not sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, well. Oh, yeah. Didn't you used to hold them and say, like, mama had a baby and the head popped off? Yeah. That's why you, that's why you pop the head off. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, here we go. <laughs> the family had never moved from their home because they wanted Stephen to be able to find them if he ever came back home. The day before his kidnapping, he signed his name on the side of the garage and they cherished that and refused to paint over it. It was dark when Jerry Price turned the police car on to bet, and hundreds of people were crowding the street, waiting for Stephen to come home. On March 2nd, 1980, just after 7 p.m., Stephen and his dog, Queenie, got out of the police car. He had been missing for 2,645 days. He recognized his parents, but had to be introduced to his siblings because, of course, they are now grown. On his first night home, he chose to sleep on a pallet on the living room floor and his brother Carrie slept next to him. Carrie said that he just couldn't sleep. He stayed up and watched over Stephen because he couldn't believe he was finally home. I was going to say, yeah, when they were talking about staying up all night with Timmy, I was like, yeah, how could you fucking sleep? I wouldn't. No, I would want to take would my be, eyes off him. No, and there'd be so much adrenaline running through you, too. Holy yeah. shit, I wouldn't sleep for like a week. For sure. <laughs> for so many nights, he had sat outside wishing on stars for his brother re to return. So this time, he went outside and thanked a star instead. Oh, <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> We touched on this at the beginning of the story. When Stephen was kidnapped, there were two men involved. When the police interviewed him, they knew there was a second man, but Stephen did not want to provide the information to them, and it took several hours before he finally said the kidnapper was Murphy. He remembered that he wore glasses and worked in Yosemite. They called up to Yosemite National Park's chief law enforcement ranger, and he said there were two Murphys that worked there in 1972. The photos were shown to Stephen, and without hesitation, he picked out Irvin Edward Murphy, who went by Murph. Rangers waited at the Yosemite Lodge for Murph to arrive for his 10 p.m. shift, and he was arrested. He explained that he was expecting this, and he said, quote, at 5 o'clock Tuesday morning, I left my cabin and went over to Lodge and got a newspaper and read it myself. And the paper said that they were looking for an accomplice, so more or less, I knew that they were looking for me. So I went on to work that night, and I'm just starting to work when they came in and picked me up and I told them all about it. It was a relief to know where the kid was and that he was alive and not hurt or anything. He could have been dead and I finally got it off my chest, then I knew Parnell had kidnapped that kid. But at the same time, I hadn't wanted to get involved myself. He said that he did actually try to tell the police one time, but he got scared. He called the Merced Police Department, and the phone just rang and rang, and then a lady answered, and he got scared and hung up and ended up just getting drunk instead. Been there. <laughs> not to the cops, but I have definitely made a phone call like that before and then just, nap. I'm just going to get drunk instead. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. <laughs> the next day, on March 5th, 
Murph was arraigned in Merced County Court for conspiracy in the kidnapping of Stephen Stainer, and bail was set at 50000 which is so interesting because Keith Parnell's bail was only 20000 Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm like, okay, then. The Curry Company offered to provide Murph with private defense counsel, but he declined this offer. And that's where we are ending on this one. Murph. I know. I feel bad for him. <laughs> yeah. And, I know. I'm just glad you're giving me good things on this one. Yeah. Yeah, no, I appreciate that a lot, actually. Yeah, there is there is some good things happening here. No, there's a lot of good things happening. Yeah. More bad is coming, but oh well, there's yeah. still some good. I mean, I expected that, but at okay. least you ended not horrible. <laughs> you didn't like tell me something awful that's just gonna ruin my whole last night. No. So I appreciate that. Thanks, no, Sunday. as of now, both kids are back with their families. Yes. So there you go. Yes. <laughs> that's where I like them. Okay. <laughs> All right, so make sure to follow us on any of your podcast apps. Tell us the stories you want to hear. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Leave us a five-star review if you love us. Tell your friends. Tell your cats. Um, Bye. bye.